Welcome to the Restless Creatives podcast. Comfortable chats with inspirational creatives. Hosted by three self-confessed restless creatives, Lucy Hunter, Fiona Pickles and Bridget Girling. This week we chat with Caroline Beck, a journalist and flower grower. Her career started off on Radio 4 on the Today programme, interviewing politicians. She now writes inspiring garden articles in magazines such as Gardens Illustrated and runs her own flower farm and floral business. We discover she thrives on being busy. Well, thanks Fiona and thanks all of you for inviting me actually. In fact, I spent a lovely weekend re-listening to all the podcasts. Oh, we're sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, no. And actually I thought, oh, I feel quite nervous about oh, doing this. Yeah. Such august company and such interesting people, all with really interesting takes on kind of what it takes to be creative because yeah. I think this year has been really difficult because at the beginning of the year we all said okay we're going to use this time and this is what we're going to do we're going to do fantastic things we've got this time and and actually <laughs> my creativity just disappeared like scotch mist I did not have the bandwidth to do anything no but creative. you were struggling around and, and just trying to earn a living weren't you I mean blimey. that's true I was doing that but um but actually when uh, the end of the season came at about sort of October time. Then I had this sort of burst of creativity and I've been pretty good ever since. So actually, I know you've only just got these podcasts going, but had I listened to them at the beginning of lockdown, I would have thought, pa, who are all these people doing marvellous things while I'm just like <laughs> flailing around being depressed? Um, but actually now I, I do want to listen to them because I want to listen to how other people have coped with it. I think mm. my standout actually was Rose, Rose Davey. Not that, she's got fabulous. Small she? child, yeah. another one on the okay. way, which she's probably had Literally by now. Literally days. Yeah. She's, yeah. It's yeah. here now. <laughs> yeah, I thought it might right after, be. I think and, it was. and yet she's done all these amazing things. Yeah. And I think she was yeah. just incredible, actually. Yeah, really she, good. she really was yeah. very inspirational. Also inspiration. Mm. And we haven't actually asked how people have coped with lockdown, right? I think, really. We've not really almost referred to it. We're just trying to, trying to find out the creativity side and, you know, almost... Don't mention the great big elephant. Yeah, in the room. <laughs> I think, well, the, for me, the two have sort of gone hand in hand. I say because at, right at the beginning, I didn't have, I was just trying to keep everything going. Um, and then when everything kind of looked rosier and brighter, sort of October time, then I did actually have, it was like a dam uh, mm. that had, be, had been there within me. And then once I sort of relaxed and thought, okay, we're going to be okay, I can do this, it just broke. And ever since then, I've been doing all kinds of things and really, uh, yeah, mm. really enjoying myself, really enjoying myself. But I know lots of artists, particularly women artists, who, again, at the, right at the beginning of this, thought, OK, this is my year. OK, this is what I'm going to do. And they've just, they're just stuck. Some of them mm. still are stuck. Mm. Um, mm. And I think Rose might have said something about this, actually, the more you think about it, the less likely you are to be able to yeah. produce something yeah. because actually that fear is that fear that holds you back all the time. I think she said a, a great line, which is, you've just got to do it. Mm -hmm. Everyone's yeah. making it up as they go along. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we are. Yes. yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And you've just got to get on and do it, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, I think which is great advice. Anxiety, though, is, is, is difficult, though, to be very creative if you're very, you know, anxious about bringing in money, you know, or you suddenly think your income stream has stopped or you don't know where it's going to happen, which happened for so many people, didn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 back in March, April time, and you're so busy thinking about that. It is this huge barrier then to doing that creativity that, of course, you know, mm. so I think, maybe... I think when, we, when we look back at March, we just didn't know what was coming. It was, mm. it was it's probably, probably just as well. Though, isn't yeah. it? Well, it, it, it probably was, but that also didn't help with anxiety because you just think, but so I'm now told I can't do anything. I can't leave my home. I can't do anything. Mm. So how do I pay for mortgage? How do I feed the children? How do I educate the children? It, it, suddenly there's things you've, it, it, it just the enormity of it all and the fear of the actual virus itself. Mm. I mean, it was a bit of a perfect storm for anxiety and depression and worry and not mm. good times. No, I mean, it feels now like we were, I mean, I keep a diary. I've kept a diary 
for uh, probably the last 30 years. And actually the one thing that did keep me kind of upright and grounded was writing every morning. So I used to get up very, very early and just scribble whatever was in my head, which is what I would normally do actually. Um, and I was going through, I mean, I wrote like a demon um, and I was going through what I'd written the other day, actually kind of in preparation for this. And I had to stop reading it. It was just too much, really? way, way oh, too God. much. Yeah, because it now feels like we were standing in front of a huge tidal wave and we didn't know. We didn't know. I mm -hmm. mean, thank God we didn't know. Yeah. But yeah. Um, if you think about last year when we kind of plunged into sort of supreme chaos, I mean, thank God we didn't know that a year on. I mean, if anybody mm. had known that a year on that we'd still be in lockdown, what would we have done? Mm. We certainly wouldn't have had the bandwidth for any kind of creativity. No. Even we dear Rose wouldn't bed. have done. <laughs> we would have gone to bed. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have gone to bed and stayed there. Yeah. I, don't, I actually can't think what people would have done. You know, it would have just, I don't know. You can't say, can you? No, you can't no. say. No. Mm. You can't say. Anyway, so you're such a creative person and probably a lot of people, so people will know you as Caroline Beck, Verdi Flowers, but there's a whole lot more behind that, isn't there, Caroline? Which, you know, I mean, we know each other, we've known each other for a few years and, and I probably don't know. So I, I'm really intrigued to know what was Caroline like at school? Were you Ooh, really creative? And then no. how you sort of, what, what stages you went through to get here? Mm. No, not creative, very shy child um, from a very wow. difficult, very, very difficult household because my father was an alcoholic. So he was a very uh, troubled, violent alcoholic. So actually the, the, the house itself, the home was not a safe place to be in. So what I used to do is I used to just escape. We had, not, it wasn't a big garden, but it was built on um, an, an old orchard. So the the houses were kind of relatively new, um, but it had all these fantastic old gnarled orchard trees in everybody else's garden. So because the house was not safe to be in for most of the time, um, I used to escape and basically go and climb trees just to, um, just to, well, I didn't know. I mean, what child knows what they were doing? But I now recognise this as something that I kind of needed to do because I needed to get out, be safe. Um, but also um, to get some headspace, I think we'd now call it. So mm -hmm. I was a tree climber. I was a wanderer. Um, I used to walk for miles. I had a small dog. I was very solitary because we had a very difficult household. We didn't, you know, we couldn't have friends back or anything like that. So I was a very, very solitary child. Did you and have siblings? I did, but they're much older than me. And they'd all left home by that point. So it was just me and my mum and my father. So it was... <laughs> Hello. What was that? That's the hand my, of the Baskervilles. The that sounds like and the dog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no. That actually sounds it's like one savage. of my dogs. Savage, the, po the, postman. the postman's getting it now. The postman's not getting Christmas. it. Not Father Christmas anymore. Is he going to look twice? Lost his leg now. No, he's gone now. <laughs> That sounded formidable, but yeah, but sorry. But talking, yeah, but talking about dogs. No, I didn't have a dog as as formidable as that one. But I did have a little dog who used to kind of follow me around all the time. So I've got no real, um, I've got no real memories of school. Um, I've got no real memories of a particularly well, a good home life. But I have got very, very strong memories of the countryside. However, having said all that, I grew up in Lincolnshire. And this was like the 60s and early 70s. This was the area, the, the, the time of the Silent Spring. So one of my memories, again, which is, I don't want to bring a downer on this, but actually this is quite a powerful memory, yeah. is that um, I went to actually quite a good little primary school, tiny, tiny, um, but it was in the middle of this sort of agri-industrial area in Lincolnshire. All the hedges had been taken out, all the walls had been taken out. It was just for wheat. It was just like a Canadian wheat bowl, mm. really. And um, the crop sprayers used to come over, uh, probably, I don't know, about April time. And because a lot of the children were agricultural uh, uh, children, some of them used to know or you know have farms nearby and they would inevitably know the crop sprayer. So we unbelievably, we all used to run out, right, when the crop, crop sprayer came over and kind of look up. And we used to get drenched. 
in this <laughs> God knows what absolute oh. cocktail of oh. horrors. Oh. And I can remember that, you know, we were probably about eight or nine, we literally used to look up and think this was absolutely fantastic. Anyway, as a result of that, I got really ill. Oh and, um, yeah, I got really, really ill. This is fun, isn't it? You enjoying yeah. so far? <laughs> and, uh, and I got, uh, but actually it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me because I got so ill, I actually, um, I don't think I lost my sight completely, but it went, um, it, it went, okay. And I, I literally couldn't see anything. And I had, you know, it, anyway, so I had to go, leave school and also because my mother was working um she put me in the hands of my grandfather now my grandfather was a wonderful man absolutely wonderful man and he was a gardener and he then had this small pretty distressed pretty kind of traumatized not eight or nine year old girl that he then who couldn't see anything who then um, he had to entertain. So what he did was he put on the radio. In fact, you might be able to see the radio down here. In fact, this oh, is the radio. Is. Can you see it? Yes. yes. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. That's the radio. And that's why I keep it always with me because oh. it's one of those, you turn it on at the wall and it, it still works now. And it gradually comes in and these voices start coming in. And I suddenly uh, had access to a world beyond this tiny Lincolnshire village. Oh, that's and, giving, yeah. oh, and yeah, it, was, it was wonderful. And of course, when I managed to be able to see again, I could see that there were all these uh, names on it, like Luxembourg, like mm -hmm. Hilversum, uh, you know, all these yes, names. I and I thought, names. yes, and I thought, where, <coughs> where are these places? And also I used to, the dials are fantastically big, you know, you could turn them and you yes. could hear the the voices and of course you know most of them were sort of speaking different languages coming in and out almost like tides like ghosts He's yeah it was very smooth yeah. and i loved it i was completely addicted to it because it suddenly proved to me that there was a world outside so those were the two things that saved me the natural world i mean literally wow. i think quite literally saved me the natural world which I had, you know, like most 1960s kids had access to, um, and the radio and voices and human voices. So, so how long could you not see for? About, well, I think it was about eight weeks. Good grief. Yeah, it was about eight weeks, but it was, it, I do remember it was, in a, well, it must've been about April time because I, I didn't go back to school. So I, I was off school from April to September. And that was fantastic. Looked after by my grandfather, and that was fantastic. I just used to follow him around like a sort of puppy dog. Homeschooling. Um, well, I know. Well, no, no schooling in my case, which is probably why I failed every exam I ever took. Anyway, so then uh, I kind of, you know, got out of that sort of misery that I was in, and then as soon as I could leave home, I did leave home, and didn't really know what to do with myself. I worked in um, an armaments factory for a bit. I worked as a cleaner. I worked as the worst au pair that there ever was. <laughs> um, oh, oh, then somehow, I don't know how, they must have had a rush of blood to the head. I uh, was accepted onto nurse training, terrible nurse, terrible nurse. Um, and where was this? Was this still in Lincolnshire? That's, that was in New York, actually. And then oh I suddenly got wise and I thought, why am I doing all these jobs? I got wise about 20, I think. I thought, why am I doing all these jobs? Because actually, what I really want to do is I want to make radio programs. Now, that was mad because nobody in our family uh, had ever made radio programs. At that point, and probably is still the case now, you have to have an Oxbridge degree. Okay. Uh, I've always assumed you've had that sort of background mm, because of where you came from. Yeah. at all, not <laughs> at all. I am the original imposter. <laughs> I mean, imposter syndrome, I invented it. And, uh, and I thought, and I, I don't know why I suddenly thought, I can actually do this, right? Um, and then I got myself educated. I got myself A-levels at night school. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I went to Northumbria. Somebody, again, must have had a rush of blood to the head and accepted me onto an English and history degree at Northumbria University, which is how I ended up up here okay. in the 80s. Um, and... That's when I considered I got my education. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It was full of these kind of wild professors of English and history. And I read for three years, best thing I ever did. 
And then right at the end, uh, somebody said, one of my profs said to me, um, the BBC are doing like um, uh, a recruitment drive. Why don't you see if you can get in? And actually my family all said to me, well, what are you doing that for? You'll never get in. You haven't got a Cambridge degree. Fabulous supportive Yeah, family. I know. Oh, God bless them. Families so are, are good at that, aren't they? Oh, they're really good at like <laughs> pushing me down. Anyway, I thought, actually, if somebody tells me I can't do something, that yeah. makes me want to do it even more. So I applied. Unbelievably, I got down to the last 30. Then I was so terrified. I had to go to London and I got horribly drunk the night before, <laughs> like badly because I was so nervous. And then just went into the interview and blew it completely. Completely <laughs> blew it. And um, then came out the other side, but had walked through the portals of Broadcasting House, those big doors, right? And I thought, I've arrived okay I may have blown the interview I'm but I'm definitely getting there I'm getting there anyway so then took myself off to do again a brilliant postgrad which I don't think exists anymore in radio production kind of blagged my way onto it again uh this back in Northumberland or uh, this is uh this no this was in the northeast uh, okay. uh, there were only about four at that particular time because it was about 87 I think it was and uh, there was only about four in the country and one of them was here. Anyway, I had a brilliant ex-Guardian journalist who just sort of championed me really, gave me lots of confidence and then um, got my first job in 88 and then started working for the BBC in 1990 and then mm -hmm. have been, worked for the Today programme for mm -hmm. about 10 years and then when you say worked for it what did you do I was a, well it sounds very posh actually uh <laughs> I was a senior broadcast journalist but actually what I was I was their northern correspondent I was their northern okay. lass so I was based up here and I used to run around all over the north well the north the the, the BBC's definition of the north is, is pretty broad <laughs> I know what our definition of the north is it's like massive London the way, and the north yeah yeah it's basically from Lincolnshire to Aberdeen uh and, and all the way over so they used to phone me up in the middle of the night and say could you just bob over to Wigan and I said yeah it's quite a long way Wigan I can't get there in an hour um anyway and had a great time and also at that particular time um if you think about it all the way through the 90s the the, uh, the the Labour Party was at well one of my first interviews okay that I ever did was with a opposition junior minister uh, housing minister I think he was by the name of Tony Blair. Oh, right. Never heard of him. Never heard of Tony Blair. This was like 1990. Who'd ever heard of Tony Blair? And I remember thinking you're very young and keen. And then of course I what then watched all the what then became the cabinet after 97 kind of grow up here and. All their politics were up here so you know it was a really really exciting incredibly exciting time but then I had two by the time 1999 came I had two children and also the thing about news is that it is very ding dong okay especially for <laughs> a, a program like the today program because you've got four minutes to get your thing across so it's like here's somebody who's for this here's somebody who's against it let's bang them up together so it became very reductive and actually I could do mm. standing on my head after that and um, it was quite boring after a while and I need a bit of grist to the mill to keep me going otherwise I just get bored and when I get bored I get really sloppy mm. and when I get sloppy I just kind of mm, stare same. out the window all the time and think <laughs> she'd rather be gardening anyway so um yeah. yeah and in the meantime while this was all going on I was having children and stuff um I then also really got into gardening mainly as a way of escaping the tedium of small children I think <laughs> um and I had we lived in an old miners terrace and it had a very long garden like those old allotment gardens and I was lucky enough to live on this terrace and there were at least two landscape architects living on this terrace as well and so they kind of were just brilliant so we had a really fantastic cross-section of people so I had two landscape architects who I, I still know and then old miners who used to grow leeks and show onions and stuff like that but who were great gardeners mm -hmm. um so I had that kind of all that kind of cross-fertilization going on and really learnt my apprenticeship there about how to be a gardener then 
Um, I left the Today programme in 99 when I had my second daughter, but then like lots of people who leave the BBC, I then went on to be, uh, to work for an independent company making radio programmes, like big chunky radio programmes, half an hour, mm -hmm. mainly kind of art, arts, mainly arts things. And I loved that. I loved that. So I had, so I had that, which I, you know, because I mean, most journalists are propelled by nosiness. <laughs> and that would be me because I really like to find out about people and what's going on um, but at the same time I thought mm, probably need another string to my bow because it's actually quite hard to make radio programs and get them accepted all the time so again I rang up I can't actually believe I did this oh, the arrogance of youth <laughs> I rang up Rosie Atkins god bless her who was then the editor of Gardens Illustrated and I went well, actually, I should have said to her, I don't really know anything about gardening, but obviously I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> and I said to her, I'm a journalist. I'm not a print journalist by any stretch of the imagination. I went, I'm a journalist. Uh, I really like your magazine. It hadn't been out very long. I think it'd been out about two years, three years maybe. And I said, can I write for it? And she said, yes, that'd be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, but actually, do you want to write about hellebores? And I thought, Helly what? <laughs> I've literally no idea what you're talking about. Anyway, so this you is said a bit, yes. Yeah, said, yeah, of course I said Not yes. Because I my say favorites. yes to everything I do. Right. So I found these couple of people, and one of them, he is probably still going, so I'm not going to say his name, but he was a Hellebore collector. And he went around the Balkans, because that's where lots of Hellebores originate from, from the Caucasus and the Balkans. He went around the Balkans in the transit van in the middle of the Balkans war, collecting, oh. plant collecting Hellebores. He was incredibly interested, interesting, but hated journalists. Oh, <laughs> Hello, I'm a journalist. He hated me. He thought I was, well, actually, I was an idiot. He thought I was an idiot, but he clocked me because I didn't know anything about it. But that's kind of what journalists do. You, there's a whole load of stuff you don't know out there, and then you go and find out about it. That's what we do. Anyway, so, and then there was an, another person who, I've got to be really careful about this, who <laughs> ran a very good Hellebore nursery. This is very indiscreet of me because he's probably still going as well. I travelled all the way to see him. It took me quite a long time to get there. And when I did, I set up all the interview. He didn't arrive at the interview. And his secretary said, he's having a bit of a problem. And I thought, OK, but I've actually travelled like four hours to see you, so you need to come out now. I don't care what your problem is. <laughs> and he came out and he was in tears because oh his God. wife had literally just left him that morning for another oh. woman. Oh he really God. was having oh a no. woman. <laughs> oh, God. And part of me looked at him and thought, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and the other part thought, Ben, I've travelled a long way to see you. I, we just need to talk about Hellebores. Balls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fully yeah, yeah. together. What else? Yeah. What else? <laughs> So that was my, so I'd sort of made this jump, you see, from like really hardcore news, hardcore political news to what I thought would be a slightly softer world of gardening. And actually, was it hell? I had this like mad Balkans ex-vet who was a plant collector. And then this man who was going through a massive domestic crisis who could hardly get out one sentence. And I thought, I quite Bring like this Tony world. Blair. Yeah, yeah, back to Tony Blair. <laughs> And I thought I quite like this world and and I did and then I just kept on writing about gardens so I had the uh, the radio thing going I had the garden thing going and I also used to work because my children were really really tiny uh like for one day a week renovating a garden so like as a private gardener as well so I was totally immersed in that world mm. um and then I got an allotment I had an allotment for 20 years so that's kind of another fantastic apprenticeship so People often ask about how you get from radio, which was obviously my core business, to uh, uh, being a grower, which I am now, a flower grower. And actually, it's not, it, it, it's very similar in that you are creating something from literally nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're putting something out there that has never been out there in the world before, which is fantastic. But it is also collecting a huge, huge amount of material and you're almost being like a jeweler, you're polishing it and polishing it and polishing it, and polishing it until it is perfection. And, and that is kind of the, I mean, it's 
I've got a few volunteers working for me at the flower, at the, at the walled garden where I grow the flowers. And they say, you know, what can we do? And I think, you, and I always say to them, you need to think of it as editing because actually that's what you're doing. So I think if you're weeding and you think of it as editing, it is slightly easier. <laughs> it, it doesn't seem quite so horrible somehow. Um, um, but edit, yeah, editing is what I've done all my life. Mm. <laughs> Taking vast <laughs> amounts of stuff, making sense of it, and then making it beautiful, I think. Yeah, yeah. Totally That's a really that. beautiful way of putting mm. it. Mm. No yeah. pressure bridge. Bridge does no. our editing. <laughs> <laughs> it's work in progress i am polish i'm at the polishing stage yeah. very early polishing. don't say yeah like that i love i know no i'm going yeah I'm like, yeah, yeah. The early stage i love editing yeah, but... i love editing i find it really therapeutic actually i mean i used to sit all day in front of a big screen not great for the back um, and not great for the eyes either. But when, once you had, I mean, sometimes for the radio programmes, we used to collect 20, 30 hours of material um, for mm. a 28 minute and 45 second piece. I mean, it's interesting because it, because when I made radio programmes, it is the polar opposite of what we're doing now because you absent yourself from it completely. Okay, mm. you do not appear in those programs. Uh, mm. Even when I was presenting it, which I did used to present them as well, you, you, you're kind of uh, a bystander. There's none of you in it. Actually, what you need to do is let the rest of the people sing and tell their story and you know, they're, the, they're the thing. So podcasts, when they first started coming along and it was, you know, they were much more chatty and conversational and about the people who were in them, that was a kind of anathema to me because it just wasn't what I was used to. Mm. And then I really saw the value of them. And now, obviously, I think they're great. But mm. it, last night, I had a really sleepless night last night. Thanks, ladies. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought, actually, <laughs> what I'm have I done? Kind of, yeah, I'm not kind of used to this. I'm used to actually taking myself out of the thing. I'm looking, I'm look, I'm used to being the observer, not actually, the observer. Actually, we observed. feel we're on it all the time and yeah, we're normally behind absolutely, the scenes. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but it is a it is a weird thing because it's very exposing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And actually. um and you know, when you're making programs, it, it is not exposing at all, especially radio, because no. you're not obviously not seen. And then mm. you would literally just have your name produced and recorded by Caroline Beck, and then that would be it. And mm. I liked that actually. I did really like that. Sorry, I didn't know we were inviting you onto something that you weren't really completely bought into. No, I'm totally bought into it. I'm totally bought into it. But I, I don't mean, I this. mean, I mean the, the, yeah, the, the idea of a podcast. Yeah, but no, but the idea of a podcast, I think, is 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 great. Or and also the name is great. I don't know who which of you came up with the name, but that kind of restless creativity. Because I think if you are a creative, you're always restless. But that is the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning because I'm always yeah. thinking, what can I do next? What can I do next? Mm. Yeah, and I think that's so. I mean, this came about from us sort of like chatting like this, just with a glass of wine to try and help us get through lockdown. And, and gradually it sort of came out that, and in fact, I think it was Lucy on New Year's Day when we were chatting said, I don't Several glasses podcast. of wine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was New Year's Day, <laughs> and, and it was a, it was a real sort of conscious decision. Probably the complete opposite of where you do it. You know, we we thought we we don't want to waste time making it perfect. We want to get it out there in it all its little sort of, you know. I mean, literally every week we had a different headphone on. We had a different <laughs> different mic, different lights, different room. You know, we were testing different things just to see which worked, and we were doing it as we were doing the podcast because between us we probably could have faffed around for about another six months trying to get it perfect and we just wanted to get it out there didn't we mm. yes but i think that the pursuit I, of perfection can be a bit of a killer of actually doing yeah. anything um, it, it is actually it is um and also i think it was um i think it was max gill actually in one of your podcasts who used to be an actor and he yeah. said that there was all that stuff about going for auditions and you'd give it your best shot and they'd say nah mm -hmm. one of the most killing things which about um pitching for radio programs is obviously it's incredibly competitive and at that time 
there were no other outlets, all right? Unless you wanted to go abroad and make radio, there were no other outlets for half an hour radio programs. There just weren't. Mm. And so massively competitive, uh, full of brilliant people. I mean, brilliant, brilliant creatives um, who are, most people who work in radio are pretty self-effacing and just love doing it because you don't do radio for the money. If you want to make money in the media, you go for television. Um, so they're an amazing bunch, amazing, amazing bunch of people. However, you would have to pitch an awful lot of ideas to get one through. Okay, so you used to be, I used to be uh, really adept at being kicked in the teeth and then getting up the next day and thinking, okay, oh. right, well, that's that and on we go. Um, uh, because if you don't do that, then um, oh, you wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. But it takes its toll. I had 20 years of that. Mm -hmm. It both gave me a rhino skin, which is why I don't really care very much about what people think of me, actually. Um, but it also makes you aware that quite a lot of that process is bullshit. It's got nothing to do with your ideas. Your ideas are good and sound. It's just that your face isn't fit on that particular day. Mm. Um, and I think women in particular can be very self-punishing with that. And they think, mm. actually, it's all about me. It's mm. all about me. There must be something wrong with me, yeah. which is why I didn't get my idea taken on that day. That's rubbish. It's nothing to do with you. It's just mm. wrong place, wrong time. Mm. You may have pitched that idea where, you know, the, 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 the commissioner hadn't eaten his lunch. He was really hungry and he just wasn't listening to what you were saying. Yeah. So I, I do think that's a, a kind of really tough, tough learning process. Um, but actually when you come through the other end, you kind of don't give a bugger, which is mm. quite a good place to be really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I love that. Really <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, it'd be so lovely to do that. And, and you know, I think, I think we, we have these conversations, don't we? You know, sort of how much stuff gets through the armor sometimes, you know, and, and it's like, really, we shouldn't be taking this on board, but it's just building up that, and you've obviously had years and years of it. Mm. And, and that, I mean, what Max was saying about talking about him in the third person, I just, I just can't, can't think of anything more crushing than no, he's not really got the right face or oh, the right whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, when they're next to you. Okay, I'll tell you one, a, a really, two, again, learning, learning curves, steep learning curves. All right, so when I went to work for the Today programme, um, there were lots of publicly school educated, long legged, well spoken, good looking boys that I worked with. Okay, they were great in the main, they were great. But in, oh my God, just actually just the thought of the morning meeting was, is really horrible. So the programme <laughs> used to finish at nine and you would go in either, I'd be in the London office or I'd be remote up here. And you'd have to think of like 20 brilliant ideas before breakfast. So you'd be going through the papers, you'd be finding out what the hell was going on. And then you'd think of sort of slightly tangential twists to something that had happened, bearing in mind it had to go on the next morning. So it needed to be mm. fresh. And I used to, talk to these lovely long-legged boys and say what about this what, what do you think about this idea and they go no Caroline I, I don't think so maybe a bit of old hat maybe a bit of old hat what about this then I go all right okay 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 anyway they we then go your ideas oh yes they nick my ideas they got into the morning meeting right and I was always right at the back of the queue right so the presenters and the editor who was terrifying he used to say, okay, what are your ideas? What are your ideas? <laughs> and he's going, all the long-legged boys, and they always used to stick their long legs out and go, well, <laughs> Bill, this is what I think, right? And they used to repeat my ideas. And then I was right at the back of the queue thinking, what am I going to say now? They've nicked all my ideas. I soon got wise to that. I used to sit right at the front of the queue and say, yeah. Phil, what about this? Should we do this? He'd say, yeah, go ahead, do it. And I thought, <laughs> so that was a really good learning curve. But also... Um, you used to, there were definite spots in the Today programme which you really, really wanted to hit because they were like big kudos. And one of them was the 10 past eight slot because it's got three, mm. well, it did have three mm. million people listening to it, which is a bit of a head cave because you'd be standing out in some windy field 
with a with a then a radio car and a, and a and a phone like a house brick trying to record <laughs> to the nation and um and you know but it was really good i mean sheer adrenaline rush anyway so again used to go into the morning meeting and the long-legged boys credit to them used to say oh good piece car good piece love, love it love it and then used to, and they'd all say Ian Marcus Marcus then you'd go to the loo and you'd hear all the PAs bitching about you saying oh what does she think she is that was a really rubbish piece oh do you think yeah and I used to think that's journalism are you and all those kind of creative industries they are superbly bitchy yeah bitchy bitchy, yeah. bitchy. Yeah. but yeah you, does I that come of, from insecurity on their behalf for sure for sure it comes yeah. to insecurity because actually you wanted the 10 past eight lead yeah you know they yeah. wanted it um and i don't blame them everybody yeah. you know you've got to be hungry for it and mm. uh otherwise you just wouldn't it, it's too exposing you just wouldn't put yourself through yeah. that so yeah it does give you a bit of a rhino skin but yeah it's true. funny isn't it it's, you, you wish in a way you could take that experience which only comes with age basically and doing these things and going through these hideous experiences if you I wonder whether it'd be good to, if you could pass all that up and give it to your teenage child that's just you know going through all this hideous stuff that you want to protect them from at the minute but you can't you, you they've just got to go through and learn all of this stuff as well it, it only they? has value because you've experienced it and coped yeah. I suppose yeah. but also yeah. it has what what you've been through has no value to your children don't ever think it yeah. has yes. <laughs> because yeah. they just look at you and go yeah, you know nothing. whatever whatever <laughs> never I, do that mum how stupid yeah, how stupid <laughs> and actually you know I've been thinking about all these poor women who've been trying to work and homeschool because mm. I didn't obviously I didn't homeschool I wasn't insane enough to do that as well but um there are obviously long periods of holidays where I had to work and inevitably the summer holidays would always coincide with a massive program I had to do and I had a program once this was years ago when my youngest daughter Eve she was about six or seven school holidays and I had, I was doing a programme and there was quite a lot of swearing in it. And I was arguing for the fact that that swearing was, because um, it was from a load of lads in a, in a kind of residential care home. So they're, all, they're not going to talk with cut glass accents. Mm. And uh, so there's quite a lot of swearing. And I was making a, a very powerful case for the fact that this swearing needed to be kept in because it was context. Anyway. I then had to put this through the BBC, I think he's called the head of compliance, right, which is like really big. And I was waiting all for about two days for the head of compliance to get back to me and say yes or no. And if it was no, I was getting really near this deadline. I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. Anyway, so I was working away a bit like this at my computer, editing, doing my fat boy slim with one <laughs> phone off and one phone on, you know, this, that and the other. And, but getting quite near the deadline. And um, anyway, the, the phone eventually went, the head of compliance got hold of me, but it, well, he was kind of a day late. And uh, he talked it through and he said, look, this can all go through. And I absolutely get where you're coming from. Then he stopped and he went, I rang yesterday, you know. I said, did you? He said, yes, your little girl picked up the phone. He said, it was three o'clock in the afternoon. He said, can I speak to your mum? And he said, no, I'm really sorry. She's still in bed. <laughs> How funny. And I said, I, you know, I wasn't in bed. <laughs> I really wasn't in bed. I really wasn't. I'd been up Please since like me. five trying to get this program done. And he said, well, I did think that was the case. He said, but I did also have this vision of you just like not coping and being in bed with a bottle of cheap sherry. At three yeah. hours oh, at some point. <laughs> I thought, yeah, there are days. There are days. Just one that like, day. <laughs> but also, but the children never knew what I was doing. They never, they, they. I mean, I don't know what they thought I was doing, but they they never, you know, they never listened to, well, of course they didn't listen to any of my pieces or anything like that. It's only now they're 21 and 26 that they realised that I had a life beyond mm. food on the table. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they never had any inkling or interest <laughs> in what the heck it was I was doing, <laughs> which I think is probably a good thing, to be honest. Yeah. A grounding, as they say, irritating. <laughs> grounding. <laughs> yeah. 
so what made you move away from that then did it, did it all just get too much or no, did you... I didn't, no I loved it I honestly I absolutely loved it and then uh the the Radio 4 okay has had a lot of money taken away from it a huge amount of money taken away from it and all the time I just saw it sort of you know salami sliced and even the head of Radio 4 was saying there is no more capacity so the money for uh, making really good radio programs actually became almost less than the minimum wage and you just can't do that you just can't do that and when I'm writing a thousand word piece for Gardens Illustrated or House and Garden or something like that and I'm getting paid more uh, per hour than I am doing a job where I'm running all over the country and interviewing people and trying to get them you know and then sort of collating it into a half an hour program it just didn't make economic sense so with a really and I thought actually I have been doing this for 20 years the interesting thing was that I made my last radio program probably my goodness it's it's actually quite some time ago now but it was at the time when podcasts were just coming up and suddenly I thought uh yeah that is the way forward maybe I should do it but then I'd, I'd, I'd done it a long time I wanted to do something else yeah mm-hmm. yeah you did do a podcast didn't you, you did I did do a podcast but I have to say I pretty much hated doing it because yeah. uh there are it, it, there was just too much of me in it it was mm-hmm. it was a requirement that I sort of had to be you know mm-hmm. you, you have to put lots of your own experience into it and it just felt totally alien to me I think uh, you know that's not what that's not really what I want to do I love writing mm-hmm. I love yeah, doing the garden writing, and I still do writing. That. Mm. well thank you um and um I love doing that and and I also really like growing as well it's got mm. lots of the elements that you know creatively I really enjoy I mean mm. working to a deadline is really good because I love working to deadlines I like the the kind of razzmatazz of it when you're doing weddings and things and I like the, the jeopardy that you might completely fail <laughs> and not pull it off at all I love all that and then I love the kind of joy of people I do actually really like people saying I love what you do because I'm arrogant enough to think um do you that's really good thanks uh and also I've only got really nice clients that when I was working for the BBC nobody in 20 years more than that ever said well done yeah (laughs) isn't that awful Nobody ever said, really good. I mean, sometimes you're, nobody on high, I mean. Mm. Sometimes you're, you're the, you know, the people you work with who are all the same age would say, that's a great piece. Um, but mainly not, it was just criticism. I wonder why. Was it just because they wanted to push you more? Push, push, push? Or do you think they just didn't think that you needed that? Both. Place, Both. It's the, it's the kind of environment, Lucy, I think. It's that sort of slight public school kind mm. of very English withheld thing mm. uh, that you don't praise people um, and then you just get used to it really and then you don't expect it don't expect and it. yeah when you don't expect it you know it doesn't come as a shock when it doesn't come but mm. actually yeah I when when people are nice to me now I kind of get tear up yeah <laughs> yes yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. don't be nice don't be nice just be horrible <laughs> Horrible. it's much better I don't <laughs> cry when people are horrible to me <laughs> it's funny isn't it because when I because so I left a very different sort of corporate world and, and it was probably quite similar you know there wasn't that sort of praise culture and I mean yeah there was to a degree but one of the things so I decided I was going to go into flowers and one of the things I was worried about most was was there going to be enough stress because I, I enjoy that me sort too. of like pressure and you know that sort of like adrenaline and everything and I was thinking, oh, is it going to be stressful enough? And, and now looking back now, you think, yeah, you needn't have worried about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, some of the stress that we've had, it's been like, oh, my goodness. Your weddings can be so, yeah. so stressful, can't they? Yeah. It? It, it's a thrill, isn't it? It's it is that. a thrill. It is a thrill. And actually, I agree, they can be quite stressful. Um, but it's that kind of good stress. The bad yes. stress. The bad stress is what we've all been under for the last mm-hmm. year, which mm-hmm. is not being able to plan, yeah. not being able to see people being plunged into chaos um that's been bad stress uh yeah. but i quite like that positive stress of okay are we gonna yeah it's jeopardy are we gonna do this yeah. or we're we not gonna do it are we gonna fall through the cracks this time 
let's hope not um <laughs> and also again you know there is that thing which always used to happen uh at the bbc which is you are only as good as the thing the last thing you did yeah. Yeah. okay so and you just have to keep reinventing that all the time so if mm. you're a bit rubbish uh then nobody picks up the phone to you <laughs> and you don't get any work um but I, I don't mind work I've worked like that for so long it doesn't bother me anymore it must be so difficult to just be under that pressure to think I've got to come up with something new I've got to find a different angle on that you know I mean there's yes you would think that would start at least the doing what we're doing somehow. yeah I mean yeah. it's just scary um, ideas I've never been short of ideas actually um I'm a great walker <laughs> I walk all the time um yeah. and that's where I come up with my best ideas mm -hmm. I, I'm always coming up with ideas but probably 94 six seven percent of them get dumped or by the time I get home I can't remember the idea but I'm, I'm, I'm quite good at ideas um that's not the thing it's kind of executing them or getting them accepted I think um mm. yeah I mean I'd like to do I'd like to do um a lot more writing I think yeah. but you know trying to get things accepted is a is a tough old business it is a tough tough business so now you've got your writing, you still do your writing. Yes. You've got Verdi. When did you start Verdi Flowers? Six years ago, unbelievably. Um, wine had been taken, <laughs> inevitably. And I was at a place, actually it was a book launch uh, for a friend of mine who'd written this fantastic book. And it was way out in Northumberland at a farm. And they had a market garden there that the market gardener who'd been running the place before had just kind of upped and left in difficult circumstances and I looked at it and because I was a bit drunk I thought oh I could grow flowers there definitely I can grow flowers because I've been growing flowers on my allotment for years right that's the easy part of the job and I thought I could do this I could definitely do this yeah my kids are up now I can see I can see the sunny uplands <laughs> coming towards my life right I want to take full advantage of that and then started growing and Growing wasn't a problem. Uh, it was getting people to buy them that was selling. Real yeah. Oh yeah, getting people to buy your flowers is really, really hard. So how did and, you make that transition? How did how did that start? Uh, I was really quite angry with quite a lot of people, quite a lot of the time. So <laughs> that flowers. summer, yeah, <laughs> buy my flowers. <laughs> that summer, else. <laughs> I did a market stall, and I did a market stall with my daughter, and uh, at one and I was. You know, I really wanted people, my flowers look great. They look great. And people were going, well, they look nice. And they're just walking past. And I was thinking, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, my daughter said, right, Caroline, you just need to step away from this because you look like an ax murderer. <laughs> Uh, She's your quite, eyes, I presume it was Rosh, um, was it? Yeah, your She's eyes quite... are rolling in your head, right? And you look really grim. You can actually imagine flowers are great, but you're <laughs> off-putting. You're really <laughs> off-putting. So I went away to do something. And she, I come back and she'd sold about 10 bunches. But she was like, hi, <laughs> hi. And I was like, <laughs> so anyway, so I learned from the best because she's all smiley and happy. And uh, so eventually I did that and I, and I worked out, oh, you know, there's a big kind of education thing. There's a big education thing in people, in getting people to buy flowers because people think that flowers are really easy to grow. And in some ways they are, um, but uh in other ways they're really not mm. so it, it, again it's like anybody who's doing anything creative it's like paint you know when you go to a fantastic gallery and you see uh, you, you know an amazing abstract and then you get some idiot standing in front of it going oh, i could have done that mm -hmm. think, yeah. yeah well if you could have done that why didn't you done that. yeah yeah uh and it's the same it's the same with any kind of creative activity you probably mm. can't if you if you you know if you wanted to do it you probably would be doing it um and yeah, so it's got easier. It's got much, much easier. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, I was useless at selling. <laughs> really bad. Was it, it was almost too close to you, really, wasn't it? it was Way just too like, close. Please, Way too close. Please buy my beautiful I know. Flowers. Why don't you appreciate them? I know. Why don't you appreciate them, you idiot? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and do you still do market stalls? You, you, have you moved away from no, that? No, don't do that. Still... I was really lucky, actually, in that. So the first place I went to, the farmer and his wife had a bit of a falling out. <laughs> and the farmer was a bit too wedded to his glyphosate 
for mm. for me. Mm. Uh, he used to glyphosate everything every two weeks, which was a bit of a head cave. Oh my! God. Oh yeah. Instead oh, of weeding, he used to go with the glyphosate. Anyway, so kind of moved away from that. Then mm. was at a farm, which I think is where we I first got to know you, Fiona. I was at a sort of quite a scratchy mm. farm, uh, and I literally dug a flower field out of a paddock where goats had been for quite some time and there were days when I thought what am I doing <laughs> and I just kept plugging away at it and built the business up and built the business up and then um in the summer of 2019 things were looking really good for 2020 they were looking like the, you know where this story is going don't you like the rosiest is that, you know the, again those sunny uplands I was nearly in those pastures anyway um, an opportunity came up with actually a client of mine who used to buy flowers of me every week for, well, she said, I went to see her and she said, Caroline, you're looking very glum. And I said, I'm a bit <laughs> glum because I need more land and I can't find any. And she said, you know, we have a walled garden. And I thought when people say they've got a walled garden, what they mean is they've got a tiny garden with a wall around it. And I went, have you, have you there? And uh, she said, yes, would you like to see it? And I said, yes, I would like to see it. So you went, and blow me if there's not yeah. a 19th century walled garden. <laughs> it is the most beautiful place It's extraordinary, in the world. Oh, extraordinary. I've seen pictures, and you've got the glass house against the wall and everything. I mean, yeah. it is the dream, isn't it? I was, grail. I was peak Mary Lennox, right, out of the secret <laughs> garden. I was just running around going, ah, look at this. And, you know, my kind of 10-year-old, uh, that 10-year-old who used to sit in trees a lot and read books, that was me sort of 40 years later, just going, God, this is the best, this is the best. And I thought, can I do... And, and the great thing about that day, I mean, it was classic northern August in that it was raining and cold, <laughs> cold. and horrible right <laughs> which actually a great plate great day to see a wall garden because yeah. if you like it then you're gonna like it mm -hmm. you don't really want to see it in like bucolic June with all the apple blossom out and everything like this you don't really want to see it because you know you'd have to have a heart of stone not to love it at that point <laughs> so you need to see it when it's ropey anyway I did look at it it's huge and I thought mm. god do I read this is bonkers right what are you doing what are you doing this is like masses of hard work anyway I had and have a uh, um, well she was then a volunteer but she now works with me um, a young woman uh, Becky who's 23 and mm. so we were still up at the farm and I said to her look um, I'm not going to tell you where we're going but do you want to come with me and just have a look at something she went yeah 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 so we went down I drove her to the walled garden we went down this sort of rickety pathway through the woods and she just ran around going oh this is great look at this and she's got a great eye for detail and she just I hadn't said anything really about it and then she turned around and she said so when are we when are we taking it over and actually to see it through her eyes and then both mm. my daughters came down and went oh, this is great Cass what are we doing you know when are we doing it to so see it through their eyes made me see it differently so instead of seeing all the back-breaking work and I won't lie, there's been a lot of backbreaking work. Mm -hmm. I saw it for the true, right, blank canvas that it was and, and mm. is, um, full of possibility, full of beauty, full of hope. Um, and so we moved there, lot stuff and barrel from the farm, uh, just a couple of like days really before Christmas 2019. Full of high hopes loved up on this wall garden thinking this is going to be the year <laughs> end of story uh, yeah but where are so, those possibilities going to take you going forward yeah good no they're all good actually so last year uh fiona will tell you this i was like a mad woman um because when it all fell apart well who wasn't like a mad woman i mean who wasn't mad um it all fell apart and i thought God, I've got no income, this is really bad. But then I, okay, last year I learned to sell properly. Uh, I emailed everybody I'd ever met and said, I've got 2,000 tulips coming up, do you want to buy some? I mean, it was as bold as that. There's no finessing it. They're like flummery. It's like, 
please buy my flowers. <laughs> you reverted and back to that mad woman on the market. Definitely, store, definitely. Yeah, at least by email, you didn't yeah, scare them. <laughs> exactly. At least my eyes weren't swiveling in their sockets this time. So, and actually, do you know, I was supported so well. People were just great. And it wasn't just people kind of of my age in their 50s. All my friends' daughters um, supported me. My daughter's friends supported me. The, those friends' mothers supported me. Um, it was great. I mean, I made it up literally every single week. I used to start Monday morning and think, what are we doing? Can we keep going another week? But you worked so hard. Didn't yeah, you? I did. I worked like a dog, but everybody worked like a dog. Everybody did. Everybody was trying to keep that well, going. Well, I don't know because because to be fair, um, we didn't really because our our sort of like teaching yeah. and all that stopped. So we were part of the people that were sitting there with not very much to do because we didn't have flowers to sell like you did. You know, it was a it was a different thing. I mean, yes, you know, we did things rather than that we product. could do. But that yeah. comes with its own strains. Well, it wasn't that comes the same with its own strains, Fiona. I think I that it was the sheer busyness that kept me going. Mm. I think if I had been mm. yeah. uh, watching Sad my thing, yeah, oh my god, thinking what a good thing. Mm. Uh, if I had had <laughs> to sit and watch my business disappearing, mm. I think I probably would have been drinking a lot more. <laughs> um, and I would have been much more despairing. And I think that I managed to keep despair at the door at bay because I was so brilliantly supported and, and still mm. am and still am mm. and on the bay and every week it got it I wouldn't say it got easier um but it certainly by the time September came I thought okay I've nailed this we've got it mm. uh we can keep going and on the basis of that now my eldest daughter um is joining the business for two days a week from Wednesday actually oh is it this week yes this wow. week and then Becky who was volunteering for me for two years she's now uh, in the business three days a week so that baptism of fire which was last year and god it was a baptism of fire has actually now provided employment not only for me but for these two, two. amazing young women mm. amazing um, mm. They were just so, I mean, they obviously had huge troubles of their own. I think it's been incredibly difficult for their mm. generation. Mm. Um, and they just, they just bossed it and got through it and are now really excited. And to, to feed off their kind of energy and enthusiasm and optimism now is just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So Becky Bridge, Gosh, I don't know I... if you know, but yeah. Becky is, um, she's... Mm doing the bees isn't she because Bridge yeah. is going into beekeeping ah okay so yeah so along with this wall garden we inherited a, a very uh old established colony of bees and in fact right at the beginning of lockdown um obviously the bees start flying at about that time kind of mm. mid-march and we'd noticed they started flying but you know i didn't i don't know anything about bees i know nothing about them i had to look after them and um, I got somebody to come over and have a look. And obviously it was like, I don't know, the first week of lockdown. And when all the stats were coming in about people dying and, you know, we were all just thinking, what the hell is going on? It was just the most miserable time. Mm. Anyway, this friend of mine came in and he uh, sort of dismantled the, the, the hive and thousands of bees had died during the winter because they had suffered from a, I think it's a fungal disease called chalk brood. Mm. And this was like the metaphor. He was literally shoveling out all these dead bees. And I remember thinking, oh my God, this, I just sort of can't stand this. However, there was a sufficient colony in there that was still uh, kind of robust and vital. Um, and he managed to keep that going. And so the bees became like a touchstone for the rest of the year I just thought if we keep the bees going we keep anything going do you know what I mean it was like they mm. they were the living metaphor of just being able to keep continuing with this um and we have and we have and Becky's taken that over because she's a zoologist as mm. well as being lots of other things brilliant wow. photographer a wonderful person Before you know it, you're gonna have 10 hives aren't you I know yeah. I know <laughs> I have honey coming out our ears um so yeah and we've tried to get the garden more towards that sort of not just a sort of productive space but a kind of creative 
productive space as well so we're thinking more about the kind of nature friendly farming aspects mm. of what we do mm. rather than it just be a, like a commercial mm. enterprise I saw you doing that dead hedge is it the, the dead, dead hedge, hedge yeah the dead hedge, hedge. yeah so we're kind mm. of really thinking about this because Fiona this is a moment okay this is a moment mm. that we've got we've got this walled garden which is I mean I can't really believe I've got it I, I just keep pinching myself all the time I've got we've survived last year we've got things looking pretty good for this year once we get out of lockdown um i've got these two amazing young women working for me this is a moment and i'm going to seize it with both hands that's what i'm going to do Huzzah. yeah definitely mm. so you will wonderfully you, you know you positive will, you... yeah it's brilliant. Yeah. i yeah. cannot wait Fabulous. to come and see your garden mm. you'd be welcome you'd be welcome i mean that, that was the thing about beautiful. that was the thing about last year i i hated um not having people down mm. I mean we, mm. we you know we did have people down during the summer particularly but it's still quite strained all that kind of social you know necessary social distancing but it, it mm. does it's not natural is it mm. it's not natural have to think about standing two meters away from people it's just not natural and also yeah. in a way because I've always worked a, a, in a job where I've been quite solitary when I was a radio producer you know I used to be beaving away in front of a computer remotely from London obviously then I was writing and making radio programs and blah 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 and I'd always thought of myself as reasonably solitary no no, no what an idiot <laughs> uh, it's good to learn stuff about yourself isn't it no I really I love having people down I love it yeah. I kind of withered without people around me all the time I hated mm. it so I'm really mm. looking forward to seeing yeah. people again in the garden yeah mm. So I think that's what a lot of people have said. Sorry, Lou. Um, mm. A lot of people have said this since you've been talking to them. You know, it's the people. Mm. Yeah, all the other stuff can can come and go, but it's the seeing the people that everybody is missing so yeah, much. Completely. And very, properly very engaging and, and communicating, and you know, you, mm. even wearing a mask, you miss so much. You can't hear as well. You can't you can't see expressions as. There's so much we're missing because we're hidden behind masks and that distance as well. We're just having to step back from people. You know, it, it's not a, an embracing way of communicating, is it? Mm. You know, you, you're kind of subconsciously saying, you've got something wrong with you. I've got to stay away from, you know, it's it's not a, you know, for people who are very naturally hoggy, gregarious, it's, it's a real difficulty, isn't it? It is a real difficulty. And I agree, it's very difficult to um, engage fully with people when they're wearing masks. I mean, I you know, Obviously, we have to, but, um, you know, you can't see the whole face. It's mm. just very, very mm. hard, I think. Mm. You're only commune. And also, you need to do things face to face. Listen, Zoom has been great. And, and I, I mean, I won't slag off Zoom because it's managed to keep me kind of engaged with people who I really miss. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you cannot beat face to face conversation no. to generate no. ideas somehow. No. You know, you're talking about ideas. Where do they come from? All, all my best ideas come as a result of seeing other people and just mm. kicking ideas around. All mm. of them. All of mm. them. It's that it's energy, really, isn't it? It's kind of, when you're just even just sat next to somebody yeah. to mm. create an energy. It is. It is an energy. And I don't know where that comes from, but thank goodness it does. Mm. Um, because you, you can feel it. You can kind of feel it in the room, can't you? Mm, yeah on that note you know we've got our five questions yes i do been listening <laughs> yes i'm not always the same oh i'm, I'm dying cheeky. to know which one are you dreading <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah they're not the same and, no. and hopefully you've not done any research <laughs> no of course i don't do research no, not at all anyway is it so, one? first one um yeah. <laughs> that's what i've been hoping for yeah. what was the last book you read Oh, I tell you, actually, the last book I read, in fact, when I was listening to re, re listening to the podcast the other day, um, I was thinking, I'm geared up for this. Weatherland, which is by Ooh. Alexandra Harris. Can I recommend this? Ooh, yeah, I can't well, recommend it more highly. Okay, so during the, the bleak months of January and February, uh, where you know winter's really tough in the north yeah. pennines it's really really yeah. hard it's its own form of social isolation anyway i was keeping busy and i was listening to a lot of private passions on radio three which i really love and um they had this woman on called alexandra harris who i've never heard of but 
I really like this is so oh, this is so fangirl of me really I really liked all her music right and I thought oh she sounds really interesting and then she'd written this book called Weatherland which is um it's it's the weather as seen by write, writers and artists and how that's been interpreted oh, wow. right the way from Anglo-Saxon chronicles who only wrote about awful winter weather and bearing in mind I read this through January it was really kind of comforting <laughs> and all the way through to our kind of uh, anxiety about climate change now and she writes like an angel she's incredibly well read she's mm -hmm. I think she's an Oxford professor of literature but none of her research she rams down your throat at all she wears it really really lightly it's easily the best book I've read um, wow. for about five years I think I knew you'd have a good rec recommendation yeah, I think it'd be quite amazing. that good superb, <laughs> that superb. <laughs> weatherland yeah <laughs> Excellent. I've written that down. Yeah. Um, right. Lark or owl? Oh, lark. I am the lark. Uh, I used the to be an owl. for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, that's yes. small children <laughs> and dogs. Um, so I used to be a proper owl because I'm Anglo-Irish and, you know, the Irish are up till all hours. And if I can get past 11 o'clock, I can go till four. But there's a, there's a lull <laughs> between half 10 and 11. I'm thinking... <laughs> the bed is really like a very happy place to be but um but yeah yeah I'm a lark I'm definitely a lark what did it Virginia Woolf used to call it the cream of the morning brain and actually oh, really? yeah and actually I'm really good between I normally get up about six half six yeah. by one it's all over so <laughs> you've, exactly you've, you've got an hour left yeah. before I could start getting blazing over yeah it's exactly over. what you say isn't it lucy yeah that's, that's about you... six till about half ten though not <laughs> sure, sure sure window. <laughs> amazing at that reason it's funny isn't it because i i became much more of a lark during lockdown so i got up almost every morning you know to see the sunrise mm. because it was the photos you got and everything and it became a bit of a thing because i'm i'm mm. naturally an owl but uh, last year i was a a real log mm. and I think it makes a difference when you think well I haven't got anything to do for the rest of the day so if I run out of energy I'll go and have a nap, yeah, have a nap yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. it's the dawn chorus as well isn't it as that oh, yeah. starts to crank up and you just think I can't miss it I mean I, oh, poor neighbours when right. I stick my head out of the window stark naked four <laughs> o'clock in the morning listen good <laughs> lord <laughs> right the trees are all in leaf they shouldn't be able to see. <laughs> but you know you just think this is magical it's absolutely magical. magical it is magical mm. it, it, it mm. is magical it you know I've I was rereading re the diary that I wrote last year and what I think this is the bit where I stopped reading um was that I couldn't actually I was in such a kind of um oh, I was in such a rubbish place I couldn't hear the dawn chorus of course I could hear it but I couldn't connect to it. And for me, that is not right. Gosh. It was like, the only thing I can compare it to is, is like having grief, deep grief. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure all of you have, have experienced that where you know something is going on, you can see it, but you just can't feel it. You can't feel it. Mm. It doesn't impact upon you in any way, shape or form. And that's why this year, yeah, all the windows are thrown open from like 5 a.m. because I just don't want to miss any of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. On that note then, Birds or bees? Oh, well, I've got to be very careful. I would always say birds, but I know Becky might be listening and she might say, <laughs> it's about the bees. Uh, yeah, I think, I it's think harsh. birds, no, I think birds. Again, I'm, I, I, so up here, the thing up in the North Pennines, the thing that is the absolute start of spring. Um, and it happened this year, the day of the big thaw, so that was probably about two weeks ago, curlews, which mm. obviously are red list birds, you know, they're, they're, they're extinct across most of Europe. And we have curlews singing have curlews, day yeah. and night. Yeah. yeah, day and night they're singing now in that lovely, exuberant, bubbling mm. song that mm. just pours out all over the moors. And that for me is the best, the absolute mm. best. So birds, sorry, Becky, love your bees. <laughs> but for me, it's the curlew. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, what's the most inspiring place you've ever been? Well, oh my God. There's going to be a good one here. I know there is. 
actually, I think the most inspiring place I've ever been, and it was a bit of a life changer, was Iran. Um, so years ago, let's have a think when it was, it was probably about, okay, Iran is always really difficult to get into um, because um, the American president used to leap up every so often and say, Iran is the axis of evil. Uh, you couldn't get a visa. And then there was a window, I think it was in about 2007, eight, and a very short window, just lasted about a year, where visas were a bit easier to come by. And I had always wanted to go to Iran and write about the rose petal harvest, because in Persian culture, uh, roses are incredibly important. So is the first rose. Um, rose oil would be the first thing that you're anointed with when you're born and it will be the last thing that you are, are anointed with when you die and obviously it's incredibly important in um, uh, sort of ceremonial rites but it's also very important through cooking and you know culturally it's huge and anyway so the long and short of it is that somehow we managed to get to Iran me and a photographer and Gardens Illustrator. I phoned up Gardens Illustrator and said, I'm going to Iran. Can I write something about roses for you? And they went, yeah, whatever. Just so I can come back with love. So I thought, all right, okay. So on that basis, off we went. And we were there. And it seems incredible to me now because at that point, and probably is still the, the, the case now, you cannot get any communication with the outside world. So literally, I couldn't communicate with my family at all for two weeks. So before I left, Andy, my partner, said to me, the next time I see you, I do not want it to be on the nine o'clock news, okay? Oh, my so God. Just, you just God. need to be a bit careful. Um, and um, I got over there, and oh, my God, I loved it. I loved it. So it was like the, the Iranians are a bit like the Irish, but with sort of warmth and, you know, like sunny weather and hijabs. <laughs> Um, and they just love to party for kickoff. They have this very inside outside world, which is outside, they have to be very, very conformist. And then inside, off come the hijabs, off go and they party hard. Really? They party hard, yeah. <laughs> And they love their music. They love their the cooking. They <laughs> <Yeah. They, laughs> Oh God, they love it. They love it. And so, and as two women traveling by themselves, they kind of felt it. Um, they felt obligated to really look after us. Really, so everywhere we went, we were just treated like uh, princesses. Really, it was just great. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was such a cultural shift from anything mm. that I'd ever uh, seen. Really, um, and also there were all these sort of brilliant brilliant young women who hadn't had any highly educated young women who hadn't had any contact with the outside world who were engineers and doctors and this that and the other and they'd come up and, and they'd say it's so great to see somebody from the outside um oh, and can we find out about you and can we have tea with you and stuff like this and yeah it was brilliant and I, I did actually manage to get three articles I think for Gardens Illustrated out of it as well which was great um but that was the most inspiring place I'd ever been. And ever since I've been trying to get back, but of course, mm. there's no chance. Mm. No chance. But and what, is that a complete coincidence that Roche doesn't, doesn't, didn't Roche study something along those lines? Yeah, it's interesting. She did. So this is my eldest. She, um, it's, it, 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 it would be difficult to say how much that had rubbed off on her. I certainly know that at the time I had to have an Iranian visa and you have to wear a hijab, okay? And I had to have it all printed out and this, that and the other. And when my daughter, so Rosh probably would have been about 12, I think. And she saw it and she sort of gasped because she didn't recognize her own mother in, in the visa picture. And so for her, because I was made sort of strange and different, that must have piqued her interest into the mm. place that I was going. Do you see what I mean? Because yeah. it was so, it, I, might, I might have been, well, I might as well have been going to Mars mm. for all she knew about it. And then I, of course, I brought back all these photographs because I mm. traveled with a female photographer who's a brilliant photographer um, of the most extraordinary places. Because I mean, Persia is the uh, birthplace of gardens. Mm. That's where they came from, all the stuff that the European borrowed they borrowed it all from Persia so you're kind of deep diving into the history of gardens which goes back thousands of years mm. so it was it was extraordinary place mm. two, two right. weeks that really did change my life actually mm. blimey
Excellent. Well, um, I was going to say, tell me something unexpected about you, but you kind of done that. In that so. <laughs> I'll add on, I'll add on wine or gin just to satisfy you. Well, I thought hard about this, <laughs> oh, right? Good job you I asked. I really <laughs> thought hard about this. I think, all right, this is quite pedantic of me, but I think gin in months where there isn't an R in the months, i.e. summer, and uh, gin at six o'clock, I think, is one of the sweetest pleasures known to woman. Um, <laughs> just gorgeous, gorgeous. But then wine, definitely. So can I say both? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course you can. Really. yeah. yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because my mum was a massive gin and tonic drinker. Mm. I don't mean she drank loads, but, you know, it was her favourite <laughs> drink. Yeah. And she always, it was always like, is it five o'clock and have my gin and tonic yet? And when she died... We all said at five o'clock, we're going to have a gin and tonic. And I'm not the biggest fan of gin, I'm afraid. So I had this gin and tonic and I was like, okay. And I, I gave the rest of the glass to somebody else because it's, it's one of those things that I really, really want to love. Unfortunately, I got very, very, very drunk on it when I was a student. Uh, okay. And it has not so good connotations. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so no, I, I absolutely, yeah, I love it. For me, it's like the essence of a summer drink. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I did hear this. You know, we've got so many fantastic people living in this Dale, real characters. I did hear about somebody, she's she's quite, she is elderly, she's elderly, and she's dying. She's got COVID and she's dying. She knows she's dying. But she's refusing food, but she's still drinking gin and tonic. I think, go go girl, you go girl. She's just having one gin and tonic at six o'clock every night. And I'm thinking, that's going to be me. That's going to be me. (laughs) But you always seem to have lived with really creative people. Sorry, I know we're sort of closing off, but you, everywhere you've lived, you've been in this little sort of enclave of creative people. I have. I, I think I'm really lucky, actually. Uh, I mean, this place that I live in, in, in Weirdale, I know you've been to visit me, Fiona, but it is, it's a strange place because it's England, but not England. It's more, it's much more like, I mean, the landscape is like Iceland, to be honest. It's bleak moorland. Lots and lots of people find it too hard, too bleak, too unforgiving. It, it, it's not one of those... See, it doesn't feel like No, but you me, live in the but, Pennines. And I'm, I'm kind of in that, that sort of environment. Yeah, uh, people who often come here from the south of England, particularly when they come here um, from very wooded areas, uh, they just, they mm. just can't stand it. It, it. There's just not enough trees for them. Um, and also it's a post... Well, it's a post um, kind of rural industrial area and that there's there's, there were lots of quarrying, lots of lead mining, lots of uh, limestone extraction. But the thing when you ask me what's the place that has inspired me the most, I did think about Iran. But I do also think this place inspires me every single day, because, again, it's a place that has been. raped actually continuously you know it has been mined and quarried and uh really badly treated but because nature has crept in so I could take you up to an old quarry hasn't been quarried for probably 100 years and I could show you bee orchids in the summer and I could you know I think you've taken, taken that, you there you? yeah you take me yeah to... we've got curlews I can hear cuckoos in the summer she knows how to show a girl oh I do take her to a quarry and see, I know <laughs> take you to a quarry and show you <laughs> a bee orchid tonic. <laughs> oh, well <laughs> that would be the absolute dream but but it attract but I think this place does attract um kind of slightly well people like me probably slightly kind of misty-eyed romantics mm. um, and a lot of those people do do amazing creative things I've got a friend in the village who makes amazing stained glass beautiful beautiful stained glass I've got lots of friends who are artists lots of people who are makers creatives um it's a hard place to live I won't pretend otherwise but it out of hard things good things come as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. Better let you get on with your your day to, day to day life and <laughs> seed sowing, talking about all these gorgeous oh, things. I've really enjoyed it. Actually, I've really enjoyed yeah, it. Amazing. You know, I had sort of oh, terrible really insomnia lovely. last night, thinking, "What am I going to say?" And now it's like <laughs> I've been talking for an hour and a quarter. Hello, I can't <laughs> believe you ever think how. What am I going to say? <laughs> I do sometimes, <laughs> not often. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Well, you get on. Uh, I really thank enjoyed you. it. Thank oh, you so much. It's been wonderful to have you. Thank you. You take yeah, care. See you soon. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Restless Creatives podcast. To ensure you don't miss our next episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.
the Restless Creatives podcast. If you'd prefer to listen rather than watch us, you can catch us on one of your favoured podcast providers. For more sneak peeks and behind the scenes fun, visit our Instagram at the.restlesscreatives or visit our website therestlesscreatives.co.uk.